Hello, everyone. Uh, we are continuing on through the Inferno, Cantos 24 through 29. In order to get out of the pit of the hypocrites, Dante and Virgil have to uh, participate in a bit of comedy. They have to do a bit of rock climbing, all of this without modern equipment. And he comments on how difficult it is to do this while he is in robes. But they get out of the pit of the hypocrites and they look down into the next pit, but cannot see. He makes a request of Virgil to move to another and better vantage point. And Virgil responds with one of my favorite quotes from the Inferno, one that I use often as a parent. And that is, a fit request is answered best in silence and in deed. The thieves pit reminds me of the scene from Indiana Jones with the pit of snakes. The sinners have their hands tied behind their backs by serpents who, were, who wrap around them and, and threaten their, their, their soft bits, their genitalia, their neck, their, and, and things like that. They are being bitten by these snakes and when they are bitten, they explode into flames and become a pile of ash and then reform out of the ash. Dante wants us to understand that thieving is animalistic in nature. Foxes do it, raccoons do it, snakes do it. And as soon as you abandon your human side for this animalistic behavior, you're doomed. Thus you go up in flames. Vani Fucci, the representative sinner, says he was a beast. This is true both because of his thievery and also because of the violence for which he was famous while alive. He prophesies to Dante about the fall of the white wealths Dante's political party. He does this as revenge for Dante seeing him so disgraced for stealing the money from the sacristy of a church. Not only did he steal money, but he also stole valuable things like the chalice or the communion table and things like that. In Canto 25, we still have Fucci and he is enraged and embarrassed making obscene gestures toward heaven. He is quickly attacked by snakes, which pleases Dante greatly as he was offended by the blasphemy. The rest of the canto is very symbolic and kind of confusing as well. There's a lot happening here. A centaur named Caucus, who was the thief of Hercules' cattle, comes running past. On his back are serpents and a dragon. Several sinners are attacked uh, by snakes, transforming into either hybrid beasts, snake men, or from snake to man and vice versa. So we are truly understanding that part of the punishment of this bulge is that sinners transform into snakes and back into men. He took this idea in part from Ovid, who told the story of two Roman soldiers who were bitten by a snake. Uh, one became ash and the other became a fountain. What are we to understand here is that theft is specifically snake-like. There's a reason that Satan in the Garden of Eden turned into a snake. Snakes steal. They steal the eggs of birds, they steal the young of other animals, etc. Satan stole eternal life from Adam and Eve. Theft was the first crime, so to speak. So thieves become snakes in hell. In Cantos 26 and 27, we come to the Bolgia where the deceivers or false counselors are punished. Their souls are encased in individual flames. Why is this a fitting contrapasso? Well, when we seek a counselor, we do so because we are in need of information or inspiration. We lack something, the grace of wisdom, that the counselor possesses. When the tongues of flame descend upon the apostles on Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and this manifested as wisdom, among other things. They became teachers, counselors, evangelizers, these apostles. Here, the flame of inspiration or wisdom is consuming or torturing the counselor instead of inspiring him. Virgil questions a rather unique two-tongued flame, the souls of Ulysses, the Roman name for Odysseus, and Diomedes. Why are these two together? Well, Odysseus served as a kind of mentor to the much younger Diomedes. If that is so, then Odysseus taught Diomedes all of his supposed virtues, including metis, or cunning. Greek society thought that metis, cunning, 
was very admirable. They admired the ability to get out of scrapes or to get what you desire using whatever means available, which includes outright lying or deceiving. Thus, Odysseus, wily Odysseus, is among the deceivers with his protege Diomedes. They did many deceitful things together. In Book 10 of the Iliad, Odysseus and Diomedes went on a spy mission of sorts among the Trojans camping on the battlefield. They killed many and were able to get information that helped the Greeks defeat the Trojans. In addition, the two stole the statue of Pallas Athena from Troy. The statue had the virtue of guaranteeing that Troy would not fall as long as the statue was within the walls of Troy. Odysseus and Diomedes also went in search of Achilles when he was hiding in order to avoid fighting in the Trojan War. They advised Achilles to abandon Deidamia, the daughter of Lycomedes, despite the fact that she was with child. Bad, bad, Odysseus and Diomedes. When Virgil interviews the two, they tell another story of Odysseus' final voyage past known navigable waters, where Odysseus' ship went down with himself and all of his crew. He had manipulated the crew with his talent and rhetoric to go on this doomed voyage with him. Canto 27 is one of those cantos that has a lot of drama that had more relevance closer to Dante's time than it does for ours. There are, however, some things we can learn, both about virtue generally and Catholic, Catholic doctrine specifically. Guido de Montefeltro is the representative sinner in this canto. He's interviewed by Dante and he tells Dante why he's in this bolgia with the deceivers and liars. He counseled the Pope, uh, Boniface VIII, to lie to the Colonna family about mercy they would receive if they surrendered. The Colonna family believed Boniface and they lost everything as a result. Boniface told Guido to join the Franciscans and that he would absolve Guido for his sinful counseling. Guido is punished here because he never repented of his sin and Boniface, and, and, Bonif and because Boniface's absolution was fraudulent. So here we understand something about confessions. Confessions are valid only if the sinner is repentant and certainly would be considered invalid if the priest or pope in this case were colluding with the sinner in the first place and using absolution as a way to help people commit sins and by convincing them that they would not have to pay the consequences of them sorry canto 28 in canto 28 we have the sowers of discord or schism. Schism is a split or division between strongly opposed sections or parties caused by differences in opinion or belief. The split between the Protestant and Catholic churches was a schism. Contrapostles can be a difficult thing to understand. The word is derived from the Latin words contra, against, and patior, to suffer the opposite. Contrapassos are punishments by a process either resembling or contrasting with the sin itself. This is achieved through symbolism. First, you must ask yourself what the sinner has done in a very general sense. Sowers of discord or schism have taken a whole body of like-minded people that were once unified and have torn them apart. Thus, the sinner is literally torn apart in hell. They are disemboweled, amputated, cut up viciously. Contrapostles are not merely a sort of divine revenge. They are the fulfillment of a destiny freely chosen by each soul during his or her life. These punishments fit the crimes they themselves have committed. The most famous sinners from this Bolgia are Muhammad and Bertrand de Born. Bertrand de Born is someone you should be familiar with as he counseled Prince Henry against his father, Henry II. His Contrapasso is considered the, the ideal contrapasso. He had his head taken, removed from his body. He was decapitated specifically because he counseled someone to rebel against the head of a dynasty or a ruling family. He carries his head around like a lantern. Canto 29 gives us the falsifiers. These are men who indulged in sham practices like forgery or alchemy, which is turning various metals into gold. Understanding this contrapasso is difficult. The sinners are suffering from various conspicuous diseases like leprosy. 
how does this relate to forgery or alchemy or deceit or lies? Well, the clue comes at the end of the Contrapasso where Capoccio, the representative sinner, says the following. My face will give you its own answer and you will recognize Capoccio's shade, betrayer of metals with his alchemy. You'll surely recall, if you are the one I think, how fine an ape of nature I once was. Capoccio was a betrayer of metals and a fine ape of nature. Well, how did he betray metals? Perhaps by trying through alchemy to make them into something they were not. Alchemy can never tr truly turn lead into gold. Lead is lead and gold is gold. All alchemy can do is change its accident or appearance, but not its essence. So alchemists and forgers are apes of nature. They take something that is real and true, like a metal or a painting, and they make, and they make an ape or a mimic of it that isn't real and isn't true. They take the nature of the thing and they make it unnatural. What does this have to do with diseases? The definition of a disease is a disorder of structure or function in a human, animal, or plant. So, just as through their actions they have created a disorder of structure or function of a thing, trying to make lead gold or pass a forgery off as an original, they now have a disorder of structure or function within themselves. They have a disease. That's all for this group of cantos. Um, the final bit of the Inferno will be coming along very shortly. I love and miss you all. See you soon. Bye-bye.